Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another virtual museum lecture series presented by the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. Our community is filled with diverse stories, and we recognize that our story begins with the Indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are broadcasting this lecture on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia. And we would like to honor the centuries of Indigenous people who walked on Turtle Island before us. My name is Adrian, Visitor Services Coordinator here at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Centre. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I am so excited to welcome students from Brock University's History Department and the Brock University Historical Society tonight to present and launch the 2021 edition of their annual journal, The General. Thank you for joining us for the lecture series. We hope these lectures provide a bit of historical joy and also spark imagination and exploration of our city's rich history. If you are uh, joining us for the first time, why not go back and view, mm -hmm, and view all of our uh, lectures so far in the lecture series. There are now over 20 lectures for you to enjoy. Just look for the playlist virtual museum lecture series on our YouTube channel. A quick reminder for those of you watching through mobile devices, please check your audio settings in the YouTube app if you are having any audio problems. You may also not have access to the chat box, so you can always post your comments or questions in the regular comments section below the video. Please also feel welcome to uh, ask questions in the chat box and we'll moderate them during, uh, during and at the end of the presentation. There is a slight delay in the broadcast. So if we miss your question, we'll get to it right at the end of the presentation. Before I hand it off to our guest hosts, they're so excited, I'm so excited. Uh, let me remind you um, of the final lecture coming up uh, in our Winter 21 series. Uh, the final lecture is upon us next uh, in two weeks, April 27th. We'll close out our winter season of the Virtual Museum Lecture Series with a very special guest, author and historian at the Canadian War Museum, Dr. Tim Cook. Uh, with his lecture, uh, he'll give a talk about remembering the Second World War and his new book, The Fight for History. And, excitingly, we're already working on the lineup for the fall uh, 2021 Virtual Museum Lecture Series. So mark your calendars for September 21st, October 5th and 19th, oops, November 2nd, 16th and 30th. And just to make sure you tune in for Dr. Cook, you have to come back to hear what those topics are going to be, haha. -ha. I sincerely hope that everyone has been enjoying our virtual museum lecture series. And I'd like to encourage you to make a donation to the museum in support of our programming. Your donations help us to continue to provide the high quality programming that you have come to expect from us. We really appreciate any donation you're able to make. Please give us a call at 905-984-8880 or email us at museum at uh, during our operating hours to make a donation. Your donation makes a difference. Thank you. The General is an annual publication from the History Department at Brock University. This year, they are unveiling the sixth edition, which features an impressive set of essays. The content of the essays range from Scottish kings to poetry, to piracy, making this edition of The General very diverse. The authors and curators of this journal put it together entirely during the COVID pandemic and look forward to discussing what it was like writing history while experiencing a very historical year. I have the absolute pleasure of welcoming some of the contributing students of the Brock University Historical Society, led by our guest hosts and moder moderators tonight, the two Emmas. <laughs> Welcome, Emma Faka and Emma Kerwin. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Adrian, uh, for that introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emma, and I just finished my fourth year of concurrent education at Brock with a major in history. 
This year, I was the president of the Brock University Historical Society. And while it has been a difficult task, it has also been a fantastic experience to be a co-editor for this year's general. Uh, I just wanna let everyone know that I personally will be monitoring the chat and after each author is done presenting their topic, I will ask if there's any questions from both the audience and presenters. And there will also be a general question period at the end for anything that is missed. Now I'll pass it on to Emma Kerwin. Hello everyone, I'm the other Emma. Um, I'm also in my fourth year. I'm just finishing my Bachelor of Arts right now. I'm also the president and editor-in-chief of the Brock Press. So I've been serving out my term uh, doing that as well as pursuing my history degree. So like Emma said, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Curating this journal was a fantastic opportunity and um, we couldn't have worked with a better team to do that. So we're really looking forward to hearing more about the essays from you guys uh, and I'm sure the audience is too. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Professor Vlasak who's gonna give us an overview of her foreword for the general. So Professor Vlasak, thank you. Uh, for being here and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, well, I don't want to I don't want to take too much time because I really want to hear what uh, what the contributors to the journal have to say about their work. But but thank you so much for inviting me and, and inviting me to speak. And I just wanted to say that I was really, really honored to have been um, invited to write the foreword to this year's general. But I, I must admit that I also fed, felt a sense of I was really nervous because I felt this terrible sense of responsibility because of the nature of this particular volume that even though last year's it's the second it actually is the second volume to come out during the pandemic but the big difference is that all of these papers were written during the pandemic so it really is the pandemic volume and so I really felt this sense of responsibility that I wanted to write something that kind of captured what what it's like to be a historian during these, these momentous times to, to live through history. And one of the things that kept going, there were a few things that sort of threads that, that came up during my, while I was writing this. And the first one was that we kept on talking about how, you know, it's, you know, you don't want to live in interesting times, that the, the times were just too interesting. But at the same time, this particular historical moment is profoundly uninteresting. And I kept seeing sort of time and time again, people saying, there's a reason why in the 1920s, people weren't writing about having gone through the Spanish flu. They were writing about the war um, and they were all partying, but they weren't writing about what they were doing when they were stuck at home in a pandemic and, and about you know, burying millions of people from, from this flu. And so, so it got me thinking about how, how we are going to remember this moment in time. I was also thinking about, um, how, how you know, the, the St. Catherine's Museum, as well as Brock Special Collections have been collecting artifacts and stories and experiences from this time to, to create this archive that can be then used by future historians. But I was thinking, well, how are future historians actually gonna be writing about this pandemic? We don't know because we don't know what is gonna happen and how it's, what the outcomes are gonna look like. And also what historians of the future are gonna be interested in studying and where does this sort of blip on the, the timeline of the 21st century, what, it, what does it, you know, what, what does it mean? What is its significance? So I was thinking about all of this. And then I was also thinking about being, being a historian, being a student of history, of having to just have to go through sort of the, the machinations of going to class and writing papers and studying and, and, and thinking about what you're gonna do after graduation and, and what, what that experience um, must be like. And, and, and of course I see it from my own perspective as a, as a very privileged woman who has you know, a, a, an amazing job an amazing family and a great support system, but then thinking about how this might be experienced um, by others who, who aren't so fortunate. So, so there were a lot of things that I really wanted to sort of jam, jam into this forward, but, but also you know, sell, to celebrate what, what you've accomplished and, and celebrate what, what Brock, Brock history, what the Brock Historical Society has accomplished, what you uh, and, um, and Emma, the two Emmas have accomplished and, and what all your contributors have accomplished over this, this past year. And so I, I hope that I also was able to, to do that. And that was kind of what I, I really wanted to kind of celebrate you and, and what a momentous accomplishment this is. So um, those were sort of the things that were, many of the things that were going on um, in my mind when I was, was writing this. And, um, but also thinking too, as, as a, 
as an instructor of history too, of how, how, do, how are we gonna teach this and the impact this is gonna have on historiography as well. Because as you know, I, I don't write on public health and I'm not a historian of epidemics. I think Professor Rose can tell us a little bit more about, about living through sort of these terrible you know, plague times. But, but, but my own craft or my own, my own um, work has been itself affected by the pandemic in various ways, not necessarily in the topics that I choose to write, but the way in which I'm approaching them and the sources I have at my disposal and the new questions that I might start asking my own sources uh, in, in sort of the, the context of this particular historic moment. And so now I'm also thinking about what historians and what history written between 2020 and you know 2022 um, and the foreseeable future is going to look like as a historiographic moment in time as well so anyway those are just some my thoughts my musings it was it was really much a, a sort of a, a work of sort of amusing on on life and um, but also the the, the 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 world or the being a historian in the age of COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for that. And I think through this discussion, we'll hear a little bit more about what it's like to be a history student, too. I mean, you know, we've all experienced not being able to go to the library and pull out the books we need, you know, talk to our profs face to face and things like that. So I'm hoping that um, some of the students here today can talk about speak to that side of the equation as well. So we're going to jump into the presenters now. So we have Connor up first, who's going to give us a little overview of his essay, and then we'll open the floor to some questions either from the audience or from uh, any of the other presenters. So Connor, if you want to take it away, we're eager to hear about, about your essay. Um, hello, uh, Connor here. Um, so my essay is the uh, is titled The Band of Kings of Alexander, uh, Why Hellenistic why the Hellenistic successor kingdoms went to war. Um, for some background, after the death of Alexander in circa 330 BCE, his uh, empire, the Macedonian empire that stretched from modern day Greece to modern day India, broke apart into a series of uh, battling kingdoms. Uh, the major ones being the Antigonid kingdom in Macedon, the Seleucid Kingdom, uh, stretching from modern day Asia Minor uh, all the way to India. Also, um, the Ptolemies in Egypt, uh, Pyrrhus of Epirus, and the Greco Bactrian Kingdom of Bactria. Um, one of the things that's really fascinating about this period, this Hellenistic Age, is the incredible amounts of military engagements that these kings um, engage in. And I wanted to, my essay is asking, why they engage in it and the answer is uh, multifaceted uh like so many things in history there's not one simple answer um they are primarily motivated by a ideological um a fusion of ideology and commemorating and honoring and mimicking alexander who was famously very militaristic very conquest uh his whole thing about uh, crying that he wouldn't be able to conquer all the worlds and the universes. Um, perfect, uh, perfect example of that. There's also economics. Um, other than maybe the Egyptian, the Ptolemies in Egypt, um, the economies of these kingdoms, the, they're cash strapped often. They went on wars of conquest to supply their armies and stuff like that. Um, and then the other one being uh, geography. Um, again, other than the Ptolemies of Egypt, each of the kingdoms and um, empires uh, didn't have many natural barriers uh, on their borders themselves. The Seleucids were a massive empire. Um, the Antigonids and Macedon were, of course, menaced by eventually by Northern Illyrian tribes, um, eventually the Romans. Um, and the, the Greco-Bactrians, uh, which is modern Afghanistan, were fighting Indi uh, Indian kingdoms to the south uh, and Scythian and Parthian tribes, basically nomadic conquerors to the north. Um, and this powerful concoction of influences drove them to perpetuate wars. Um, characters like Pyrrhus of Epirus, Antigonus Monomachos, Demetrius Polyarchides, Antiochus III, Mithridates VI of the, Ponte, the poison king of Pontus, 
Um, even certain Ptolemaic rulers like Ptolemy II and Ptolemy III and Ptolemy I um, were, and even Cleopatra VII um, went on just a perpetual series of wars that uh, uh, truly mind boggling in less than 300 years of just constant near or uh, which is also a good thing. Uh, classicist, I was using class. Um, my primary sources were classical pieces, which have luckily over the decades been uh, translated into English and then published online for free, very easy to find. Um, but yeah, the it's hard writing uh, about uh, history, especially history so far long ago uh, in an age that's really very hard to understand, even in the best of times. So that's that's me. Awesome. Thanks, Connor. Is there any questions in the chat, Emma Faka? Uh, nothing right now, but um, if people think of anything, uh, we have a period at the end where we can ask them. Awesome. So do anyone from the presenters have any questions uh, for Connor about his essay? No, okay, I'll ask you something, Connor, then. Um, so I guess I know you're you're very much so into history. So what's something that surprised you about this um, this topic? Because we've had some classes together and you're very knowledgeable. So I'd be interested to hear what what is something that surprised you during this this research essay? Um, I think the thing that surprised me the most is the econo uh, the analyzation of the economics of this. Um, I'm very knowledgeable about the topic even before I did the essay, but um, ancient economics is very uh, complicated affair to understand. Uh, economists aren't historians uh, and don't really analyze ancient economies that much, and historians aren't e economists and don't really analyze ancient economies that much. Um, so it was difficult finding pieces on it. And the pieces that I did find, ancient peoples uh, and peoples before pre-modern times, they understand finances and money and things very differently than we do now, um, which helps explain why um, uh, the aid old, the adage, uh, war, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing doesn't apply to the Hellenistic monarchs because it was actually good for something. Yeah, that's awesome. It's really interesting. I appreciate that, Connor, and I appreciate you telling us uh, all about your essay. So I think we'll do some questions at the end, maybe if, if anyone thinks of anything they'd like to bring up. Uh, so next we're going to move on to Adam, who's going to tell us a little bit about his essay, and then same thing, we'll follow up with some questions. So Adam, if you want to take it away. Sure. Hi, everyone. So my essay jumps about a thousand years into the future from when Connors was kind of set, and it is focused on the Scottish War's independence and specifically on Robert the Bruce. So the essay itself was titled The Personal Ambitions of a National Hero, Robert the Bruce on Trial. And this is actually kind of a first for me in terms of how I approached the essay, because I did it more of like a trial where the actual character of Bruce and his actions are kind of being put um, to the test and kind of seeing what kind of merit was to them and how would kind of people react. And what I kind of found was peeling away the complex layers behind this man. He was at both someone who was personally ambitious. He just wanted the throne for himself. But then once he did, he just flipped completely and became devoted to earning Scotland its independence. And through so much self-sacrifice and just uh, brilliance and intelligence behind the kind of kingship that he was cultivating. So it's a very kind of polarizing person in terms of how, how should we kind of think about Robert the Bruce? What kind of legacy did he leave? And how do, do we kind of remember it? And I guess to kind of give an example of how my work engaged with it, um, he famously murdered his serious rival to the throne, John Comyn, and that was done in a church. And that kind of really polarized people, not only at that time with Scotland at war with England, but it also broke Scotland into a civil war. So Robert the Bruce's kind of actions there 
put Scotland in an even worse position than it had been previously and kind of fractured the realm significantly. But he was kind of able to pull that back together. He would, uh, sorry, he was Clement, he, yeah. <laughs> He, you know, he was kind to those who opposed his rule. He was clemency. Uh, he kind of stripped away the land of some of the more powerful people, as is kind of expected in a traditional monarchy. But he also let a lot of people keep land and kind of did a very good job at kind of reforming the judicial system in Scotland, really trying to cultivate like a Scottish court culture. So things would kind of really help Scotland as a kingdom come together. But then again, underlying all of that was the fact that he was at one point willing to trade Scotland's independence if it was to gain him the crown. So how, how do you kind of square these two, these two kind of different people together, right? What is the right balance between the good side of him and the bad side of him? And that, that is kind of why, um, as I was going through my essay, I ended up feeling, I can't either make him, I can't, I can't deliver a verdict of him being guilty or innocent because he's neither, he's somewhere in the middle. And I believe appropriately, I kind of uh, went with the Scottish verdict of not proven. He was neither found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, nor was he completely innocent. That's kind of a quick overview of my work. Awesome, thanks, Adam. Um, we do have a question from the chat um, from Shelby. What did you find was the most interesting point you came across when writing this paper? Oh, uh, oh, there are a lot of them. But I suppose, I guess kind of looking at my notes a little bit, if I had to choose one, it was his ability to, actually, it was his clemency. The fact that he could go from murdering his rival almost in cold blood or in a fit of passion in a church to kind of treating that rival's family with some kind of level of kindness and forethought that if I just rip them away from their land completely, it'll just make things a lot worse. And so he was really trying to kind of heal those gaps. And I believe that that speaks very strongly of the type of character that he became as a king and as a role model for his people. Awesome. Do we have any other questions from the chat? I really encourage everyone to ask some questions. I've known these people for years and they're all fantastic. So uh, if we don't, I... Awesome. Thank you, Adam. We'll move on to Cal now. So um, Cal, if you want to take it away and tell us a little bit about your essay. Hello everyone, I am in the same ballpark as Adam here as I am uh, exploring uh, the period of 1304-1307 with the Scottish War of Independence. But specifically, uh, my paper is a film review. So looking at uh, David McKenzie's uh, 2018 Netflix film, Outlaw King. So specifically what my, my essay is engaged with is, is how this historical period and the moment specifically uh, from the, the truce between the English and Scottish forces to the battle of, of the victory at uh, uh, Luden Hill and how that is represented through film. So I find that this is very particular, particularly interesting in the COVID moment as, uh, as we're all stuck at home, uh, the, the first things that we're going to is usually uh, streaming services. And I'm finding that now more than ever, there's, the, there's a swarm of these, these films that are on these streaming services that are uh, engaged with these historical narratives. So the, the, my interest, uh, uh, not only in this paper, but for many of my papers throughout uh, my, my uh, history degree have been, okay, how, do, how have filmmakers uh, looked at historical narratives and interpreted them for the screen? And unfortunately, while I found this particular film to be uh, engaging on the aspects of drama, it was very, it only barely uh, sk skimmed the surface in terms of the historical accuracy and the depth of this, this critical moment for, in uh, Scottish history. So I, I paid uh, attention not only on the, the actual figure of Robert the Bruce, and I appreciate how uh, Adam goes over the complexities of his figure, uh, of, the, of himself being as like not only self-interested, but then also dedicated to the independence of uh, Scotland. 
Uh, unfortunately, I found that in the film, uh, we're, we're seeing uh, a narrative that is being watered down to a, a kind of underdog narrative, a David versus Goliath. And what you find are a bunch of historical inaccuracies, uh, especially leading up to the Battle of Luton Hill, where uh, Edward, Prince of Wales, wasn't even at the battle, but the film depicts it as this big climactic fight between Robert the Bruce and uh, and uh, the soon-to-be Edward II. So it's it, the film attempts at capturing the complexities, and especially the the, uh, the the idea of. Uh, of uh, Robert Bruce being uh, labeled Good King Robert, because that's not a title that's just handed out to anybody. It's specifically, uh, he he earned this not from his uh, like his rapport with the community of the realm of Scotland. So uh, th there is a great depiction of his relationship with the Scottish people, but then it just is watered down to this this good versus evil underdog narrative. And uh, it really goes to show that not only the difficulties that filmmakers have in kind of capturing historical accuracy, but also providing an interesting narrative and storytelling and such for a, a wider audience. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much what I, I did for my paper there. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. I'll ask a question. So do you think historical accuracy is important in 21st century historical films? Or do you think they should just be viewed as a film in the 21st century? Um, or does that put at risk people's perception of history, in this case, Scottish history? I definitely think that historical accuracy is, is integral to uh, these sort of films. It, this this goes beyond just the basic, you know, the, the costumes and the setting and that sort of thing. Uh, I feel like a successful historical film is able to capture kind of the primal experiences of that period, even if it's, you can't, because of course this period, there's only, there's so few, that there's only a number of uh, documents that we can look back and to paint a portrait of this person. So there's a certain level of imagination and interpretation that has to be involved for this. But I feel like a successful historical film is not only capturing kind of the, the basic historical accuracies, but kind of getting the viewers into the mindset and into the shoes of these, these, these people, these historical figures. And there, there are a few films that I can think of on top of my head that really start can, that actually have really gotten to that point. Uh, it's, it's a challenge and it's something that I feel like any filmmaker that's dealing with historical narratives uh, is gonna have to face and deal with. Yeah, awesome. I feel like I have to ask now, what's your favorite historical film? I have to say it's Robert Eggers' *The Witch*, uh, New England. Folk, oh, folk, yeah. it's 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 a it's probably my favorite example of how how you can use film to to understand and capture the Puritan nightmare essentially, and it allow it allows for contemporary audiences to understand why would the the Puritans be so afraid of witchcraft? Why would why was it that they were so afraid and believed in in that? So it, it doesn't have to be historically accurate in the sense that there's no supernatural stuff, but it's it's <laughs> capturing that that primal fear and that mindset. So you're able to to gain a connection that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I watched the trailer for that, Kyle, and I thought too scary for me, but the trailer looked really good. And I've heard it's a fantastic horror, uh, historical film, but too scary for me. Um, I think Emma has some questions in the YouTube chat if we're going to move into those for Kyle's and then we'll move on to the next essay. Yes, um, Kyle, we have a few questions for you. Um, so first, I would say ask you from Amanda, what would you say there is still value in watching these films and getting introduced into historical topics. So I know you talked about the witch, but uh, do you think films are useful in getting introduced to different historical topics? What are your thoughts? I think it, it's ap films are absolutely valuable in in being introduced to these things. So like for for this film specifically, the uh, the Outlaw King, I I totally a hundred percent recommend that people go watch it. Because it it serves as that introduction that the, of this crucial this crucial moment. So I, I feel like the benefit of film is that it it could not only are you provided this entertaining story, but it can encourage viewers to seek out more uh, in terms of uh, the actual historical research or books and that sort of thing. So there's definitely value 100% in viewing these films and then uh, reaching out and uh, checking out other sources. Um, Cal, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the musical Hamilton. Um, mm. 
but it's been very popularized. And I just wanted to know what your thoughts are on its accuracy and representation. I actually have not seen <gasps> the, 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 the latest, because is, is that on the, the Disney streaming one? Because I, I do not have that. <laughs> so I, that's on my list, but uh, I can't speak specifically to the accuracies of that specific production. But uh, yeah, the, there's that. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next presenter then. Awesome, thank you, Kyle. So next up we have Bailey, who's gonna give us a little overview of her essay. Um, yeah, so we are jumping a little bit into the future and jumping countries. So my paper is entitled Eradicating Religious Differences, uh, Religious Turmoil During the French Wars of Religion. So uh, the French Wars of Religion were between the years of 1562 and 1598. Um, but specifically, I examined the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which happened in August of 1572. Um, so I explored the connection between religion and violence. So the riots and the violence were justified by religious tensions between the Protestant communities, which were growing significantly, and they wanted to um, publicly worship, which they weren't allowed to do at that time in France. Um, and then between the Catholics, who they were feeling very threatened by the Protestants, um, they had religious superiority and they just did not want to give that up. Um, so to put it kind of bluntly, I guess like coexistence for them was just not an option. Um, so the crime on the day of the massacre included obviously a lot of death. Um, but a lot of property damage as well, including a lot to churches. Um, and what I found super interesting was there were in many instances that women had a role in both inflicting violence and being the victim. So it wasn't just them being hurt or punished, it was them also being um, violent towards others as well. Um, and then there was lots um, of religious leaders and royal leaders that had a lot of influence in the wars. Um, so that included Catherine de' Medici, uh, Henry II, and Charles IX. Um, so they played an important role in the tensions um, leading up to the massacre and after for the next 26 years of the wars. Um, so the massacre, again, was uh, caused by strain on religious relationships and the inability for the Protestants and the Catholics to accept each other as legitimate. There was a lot of back and forth, and they just really, they really did not like each other. Um, so exploring the massacre in particular, the violence and death of Huguenot leaders and the masses was justified by the Catholics as being the work of God and um, religious influence influences in France during the time of upheaval were very heavy and they were able to sway the masses of the people into violent criminal acts that were inflicted upon each other in the hopes for religious freedom for the Protestants and in the case for the Catholics, a monotheistic France. Awesome, thank you, Bailey. Is there any questions in the chat, Emma, or should I uh, ask it, ask a question? None from the chat so far. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Bailey, I'd love to hear more about what kind of challenges you face as you wrote this essay. It's a very niche essay I found when I wrote it, very specific. So I know I've written some essays and you know, there's always a problem where you log on and it says you can access it and then there's a password and it's such a pain to get access to some of these sometimes. So I'd love to hear what that experience was like for you. Um, yeah, you know what? I actually didn't have a crazy hard time finding things. Um, primary sources were definitely a little bit difficult, um, especially with Brock, like kind of switching their databases. It was kind of a, a pain. Um, but other than that, it wasn't super difficult. Some of the, um, the actual like language was difficult to kind of decipher and to figure out what they were actually meaning. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome to hear. I think it is it is hit or miss depending on the topic and depending on what depending on what you have access to. So I'm glad to hear that. And then, is there anything else about the content that surprised you uh, while you were researching? Um, yeah, I think like this religious nationalism sense like just kept popping up, and it was a huge theme um, in my paper. And it was it's just very interesting to see religions pitted against each other and them um, using God as them saying it's okay to kill people. Um, so it's definitely an interesting concept to think about, um, something that we even see today, but we don't really talk about much. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a valuable connection to make. And I, I think religious history is really interesting. And that comes up again and again and again, religions being pitted against one another in the name of just about anything. So yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing, Bailey. Uh, it was really interesting to read and, and I hope everyone gets the chance to read it as well. So we're going to turn it over to Mariah now to chat about her essay. So Mariah, it's all you. Okay. Um, so my essay is titled White Women Poets, the Fight Towards the Abolition of the Slave Trade in 18th Century Britain. Um, oftentimes, especially with larger political decisions, such as the act to abolish the slave trade, which was passed in 1807, most of the credit or most of the attention is focused on key male political figures. And this perspective often leaves women as being um, just seen as like, in the shadows behind the act of male abolitionists and their contributions seen as insignificant as well. So I wrote this essay because I'm interested in the topic of abolition, but also because both in my first and second year British history courses, the professor talked about the contributions of women to the anti-slavery campaign. Um, some of those contributions are the boycott of sugar, using their teapots as propaganda, political lobbying, wearing anti-slavery jewelry, and just various initiatives that the women took. Um, so for the research essay for my second year course, I kind of wanted to explore this further and particularly the anti-slavery writing aspect. This led me to um, kind of being able to find four anti-slave trade poems which I was then able to analyze. And it was kind of neat because when I was reading these poems, some of their other contributions, specifically the boycott of sugar was discussed within these poems. And one of them, um, one of the poems actually was directed for a female audience. So it was written by a female directed for a female audience. And it was kind of an effort to encourage women um, to enforce the boycott of sugar within their home, which I thought was super interesting. And then the themes that I focused on when comparing these poems to one another were the separation of family, Christianity, and the luxuries that the British possessed at the expense of the African suffering. Um, but even though these poems were exploring similar themes, they weren't really explored in the same way or necessarily for the same reasons. It was definitely highlighted to me that every author kind of had their own reasonings and um, their own viewpoint on why they were um, contributing to the anti-slave trade campaign. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Mariah. Um, so I guess I'll ask what your biggest takeaway was from this. I thought it was really interesting, the integration of poetry into a history essay. I'm an English minor history major, so I was really happy to see the two come together so beautifully. So I guess, what was your biggest takeaway? Or what did you learn from blending those two disciplines that are closely related? Um, I think I just kind of I, it wasn't really my intention to take on poetry. That's just kind of where my research led me for the anti-slavery writing. Um, but it was just really neat to kind of put those two together. And I would say my biggest takeaway was kind of just like the power of the poems. A couple of the poems, um, like I know one of them for sure was used as propaganda for the abolition committee. Another one coincided with uh, William Wilberforce's 1792, I think, abolition bill. So it was really neat to kind of see the impacts that these poems had, but then also to kind of draw it back and start picking apart and analyzing the actual poems itself and not so much its political influence, but actually what it was like discussing and the themes that they were focusing on. There was muted. I said I would do it. I just talked while I was muted. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. I think you did a really good job of analyzing the poetry as a political tool, but also as um, just, just poetry in itself. So yeah, thank you so much. Is there any questions from the audience, Emma, that we should? Not yet, but um, we have a bunch of questions that I will be asking at the end of this presentation. Okay. Awesome. Sounds like a plan. Uh, so lastly, but certainly not least, we're going to talk to Ben about his essay. So Ben, if you want to take it away. For sure. Hey, all. Um, we're jumping right to the opposite end of history with my essay, um, focusing on 2000 to present, so right up till current day. Um, my essay is no fancy title, but the impact of Somalian piracy since 2000 on international trade. Um, so I just kind of was interested in writing something about this um, and the more modern aspect of things. We've seen a lot of the other end of history. Um, but when people think pirates, they're typically thinking like pirates of the Caribbean, stuff like that. And a lot of people don't even know that there are still pirates in the modern day that affect us in our trade routes and everything internationally. 
Um, so my essay examines just 21st century piracy off the Horn of Africa, or more specifically Somalia, uh, which is also like the Suez Canal, which is like one of the most major international trade routes in the world. So it's a nice little shortcut there. And it talks about a little bit about the history of Somalia and how piracy came to be in uh, the past and their political downfall and some things, other factors that led to piracy later on. Um, the real problem that we're experiencing from pirates is that they're not only um, more dangerous for travel, but they're causing us more expenses on international shipping, not only on like lost ships, but higher insurance and stuff to cover things through there. Um, the, it was largest in 2008, actually, when it reached its peak, but it still affects us every year. In 2008, they reported like 150 ships captured and um, a couple more than that attacked. But 2009 is maybe the most famous modern day piracy, I should say kidnapping, uh, which is the film Captain Phillips um, is made after when Captain Phillips on the US Maersk Alabama was uh, taken aboard by some pirates. Um, and you'll see that it's led to some other problems in the world. Uh, it's still a current issue as there's 193 reported piracy incidents in 2019 alone uh, that cost the US about, cost the world, sorry, about 18 billion US dollars. The, pro the main problem that I focused on in my essay was that there isn't an easy solution to piracy. Like in most things, this is the reason that it's not solved. Um, and as I think Cal and a couple other people mentioned earlier, is that their history, it's hard to look at it from just one viewpoint. There's a lot of aspects. So the Somalian people don't view themselves as doing anything wrong for the most part. Uh, piracy actually started off when their economy fell and their, uh, all their politicians fell into anarchy. And so they were developed as a temporary coast guard to just protect the coast from people. Um, and there is like, they have a claim to that as every year there's thousands of pounds of waste dumped onto their coast and people overfish in their waters. So they have some claim to the piracy for sure, um, but it's since spiraled out of control and there's just become not a lot of their job options. People need to make a living. Uh, it, for a while it was a prestigious career and they've seen some socioeconomic downfall since then. Um, it'd be, the most interesting part that I think of my essay uh, is it right at the end, talk about a couple possible solutions. One of them being time. Um, it might sound obvious, but the most, the easiest way to solve the piracy problem is to let it solve itself. Um, we need to like stabilize the Somalian government was talked about a little bit like that, uh, and solve it at its root. Another interesting thing I thought was, why don't we just stop paying the ransom to the pirates? Um, and obviously like the U S is the, I don't negotiate with terrorists, not necessarily the case as they pay money every year to these pirates do not execute some hostages. Um, and so they, for the most part. A uh, couple different options and routes to go that way. And lastly, I just wanted to say that it was difficult to research something like this um, because obviously we couldn't go to the in-person library. We did use the online chat function on the Brock Omni once though and found an excellent primary source in the 1850s newspaper. Um, but yes, more recent documents are harder to find when I didn't want to focus on the classic like 1600s piracy um, or like when it originated or anything Pirates of the Caribbean. Just wanted to talk about African piracy. And I think that's just about it. Give it a read. Awesome, thanks Ben. That's interesting you said that it was hard to find things because I would have thought, you know, in comparison to older essays in regard to primary sources or things like that. So what primary sources did you use? It sounds like from around 2000 to 2009, what kind of uh, primary sources did you focus on? For sure. I, I shouldn't have necessarily said that it's harder because um, like obviously things are online in the modern day and I could just Google like how many pirates of this have and find a couple routes different that way. Um, but some primary sources that I use, like I said, was uh, from the Brock Library it was a, a newspaper from the 1850s, like proving that it's always been like a problem and doesn't see an easy solution. Um, and some of the things that I use in the more like modern context for primary sources were um, the online reports of like how many ships have been captured annually, like the uh, cost of goods that go through the Suez Canal on a daily basis. I know just recently, actually, I wrote this essay uh, a couple months ago, but the Suez Canal was blocked and we all saw what an effect that had on ships in just a few days. Um, and so that made it even, I was like, yeah, that really is true. It's a big major shipping lane and it can be like stopped easily by pirates or a blockage. Um, ben, speaking of the Suez Canal, we actually just had a question in the chat about that. Um, did the recent issues with the ship being stuck in the Suez Canal and discussions of changing the routes have you thinking about your essay further? Um, maybe if piracy would come into play in 2021? Yeah, for sure. So like similar to what I just said, like if you as it blocks off the canal, it's a major problem. Um, but for like those who don't know, this is the route over top of Africa. So major time saver also saves, saves like fuel. So it's better for the environment. 
But without this, the old route that everyone used to take hundreds of years ago was down around the Cape of Good Hope, which is like by South Africa. Um, so it's a couple like days out of, out of the journey. It's more expensive in fuel, takes longer. So I would say like, although pirates are not actively stopping every ship in the Suez Canal, like it's not that bad, like the ship was, it definitely still has an effect. Yeah, and I have uh, one more question. Um, what is the UN's position on the let it solve itself idea that you were discussing? I see. So I would have to look a little bit deeper into it to see what they've actually like stated publicly. Um, but for the most part, I did briefly discuss this in the essay as well, is that there's not necessarily a lot of intervention that they want to be taken as it isn't like a sole problem with one country. And it's more like they aren't targeting a specific country. It's more the international community. Um, and so it's hard to solve, hard to designate resources. I know the UN is most of the countries, but um, to like allow them to stop the pirates. And also there's like some problems that go way back to like, we may have caused the origination of this piracy. So like to be the one that has a forceful solution is maybe not always the best way to go. Awesome. I'll ask a question quickly then. And then I think we'll move into the audience questions that have come up throughout the um, presentation. So I was going to ask Kyle, what is your opinion on Captain Phillips as, from your uh, historical movie expertise perspective? Well, that it's actually one film I have not seen yet. I know there's <laughs> a lot of movies out there. <laughs> but, I've, I've uh, watched it myself. What did you think you of it? Um, I would say that no movie is 100% historically accurate almost, um, but it was actually pretty good for the most part. I watched it after I wrote this essay as to not like influence myself to think that's what it was like. Um, but most of the events are like portrayed correctly. Piracy, usually not that violent as people don't want to like get shot at and have their ship captured. Um, but they do use like, if you've seen the film, anyone in the audience, they have the water cans and like a bunch of piracy preventative measures. Um, not everyone's Tom Hanks and likes to like drive the boat really fast away from the pirates. Um, but there are preventative measures they take for sure that they uh, showed well in the movie. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I think we're now going to move into some of the audience questions if Emma Faka wants to take it away. Uh, yes. Um, so the first one is for Connor. You mentioned that you had prior knowledge on the topic before writing this paper. What sparked your interest? Um, so the Hellenistic age is just fascinating. Age to me. Um, the, uh, the, and just fascinating. The wars of the Diodokai are to quote a uh, uh, term that's being used too much in his phones um to ba the battle of the kingship of alexander's throne um it's um and it's it's a different period it's a period that um a lot of people sort of skip um when they're imagining the world of like western history you got like you know e uh, ancient egypt ancient babylonia then you have uh, the Greeks, uh, and you have Alexander there and you sort of forget about all these people. Um, so that's why, that's what really intrigued me is the, is the people and the reasons why they went to war so much, because it just, it boggles the mind. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I have another question for Cal. Um, is there any tips for film majors on how to help portray history in the film industry? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I don't know how much I can speak to the film production side of things, but it's, it's really, it comes to the point where it's, it's just trying to capture you know what, the way I, I would approach it though is what is kind of what the overall goal of the film is. Is the film just to, because uh, uh, any, like a documentary film, it could be like surveying like a specific period, but if it's a specific moment or a specific story you're trying to look at, you'd be just, it's almost like uh, writing a history paper is like what sort of question, what sort of angle are you trying to explore and convey to the audience? So it for presenting, historically accurate films, it, approaching it 
with a question in mind that you want to kind of convey to the audience is something that comes to mind for me. Awesome. Uh, great answer. Um, I, I think it's really about, you know, following the advice of historical experts on set that uh, Connor just put in our chat. Um, but yeah, moving on, um, I have another question for Bailey. What kind of sources did you use for this essay? And can you talk more about the religious of the participants, its political identity, like what it is today, or how it's um, a defense of religious belief. Yeah, um, so for my sources, um, what I was using, um, if any of you have not uh, used Natalie Zeman Davis before, um, then I really suggest you do use it. She's an amazing historian, um, but I used, took a lot from her, um, her paper on the rights of violence and religious riots in the 16th century. Um, and then I also used um, a couple of primary sources from um, ranging between 1560, 1561 um, about specific towns that um, experienced a lot of violence during the wars. Um, and then what was the other half of that question? Uh, yeah, sorry, that was my fault for uh, giving you so much at once. But um, Adrian asks, um, let me just try to find it again. Can you talk more about the, the religiousity of the participants? So basically their political identity, or their defense of religious beliefs? Um, yeah, so what I found um, really interesting about that is when I um, was doing a lot of research for it, um, the Protestants, they um, targeted a lot of the idols of the Catholics. So they were more about um, targeting the physical church of the Catholics, where the Catholics were kind of doing the opposite. Um, they were more going after the culture of Protestants. So um, Henry II and his Catholic followers were targeting um, these new Protestants that were showing up and um, more about the rights of religion, where again, as um, Protestants, they were targeting the Catholic churches because they felt that they needed space to worship as well openly um, because they were practicing their religion underground or hidden away so they wouldn't get persecuted. Awesome, that's fantastic. Um, moving on to Mariah. Um, how and where did you find your poems? And can you make any connections between your research and modern day events or woman movements? That's a good question. Um, so when I started researching the anti-slavery writing, um, I kind of mentioned earlier, I wasn't planning to use poems, um, but I did find two poems right off the bat which were Hannah Moore's Slavery, a poem, and Mary Burkett Card's um, poem. I forget the title now. <laughs> but And then I kind of had to do more digging to find the last two because I found that especially Hannah Moore's poems, that's often the poem that is most um, used. So the other ones were kind of less popular compared to her, so they were more difficult to find. And then, what, sorry, what was the last part of the question? Uh, can you make any connections from your research to modern day events or women movements? Okay. Um, I kind of thought, I was thinking about this and I, and the women are often seen in the shadows in the abolition um, campaign. So I think in that sense, um, it, with modern um, women movements, I think it's with any um, modern issues revolving women's rights and, and women um, taking the step to not be seen as in the shadows anymore. So even with like female historians or female writers or just any like um, women who are who are work doing this research and working towards um, publications and things like that, it's definitely 
Um, I think we've made a lot of progress in that sense, like that women are starting to be seen as more than just in the shadows. They're starting to be, you know, in the forefront, like center stage and kind of taken seriously in terms of their work and um, things like that. So I think even, um, even though this isn't really like a common topic for people to research, I was able to still find some uh, historical or secondary sources that helped me to like guide me with this research. So I think it's definitely like a more common topic and it's starting to be more common anyways. Awesome, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, moving on, we have a question for Ben. What is your personal belief on how governments should handle piracy? Awesome. Um, well, I'm not really all for the just leave it and see how it solves itself route. Um, so I think we need to like look down at the original problem, uh, maybe solve and stabilize some of the government issues in Somalia. Um, and then they'll begin like once they have some form of government to handle themselves. Because right now piracy like in prior years has been idolized. And I think that like once it's looked at as not a valid career choice, that's when the problem begins to solve itself. Um, we, we just need like some more stable jobs and other routes for people to look. Um, and also to stop stealing fish and littering in Somalian waters. Awesome, thank you. Um, I do have a question for Adam. I was also in um, Professor McDonald's class where we had to write that essay. And one of my biggest struggles was the sources um, from it being um, from such a long time ago, a lot of the sources were broken up and you couldn't really, um, you had to interpret a lot of things. So I was just wondering if you found that as well. And what are some things that you kind of thought about the sources? Uh, yeah. The, the sources were a challenge for sure, especially when we were writing, um, I'm forgetting the, the name of one of the, the major ones, but it was kind of like the, the almost epic poem and the way in which it embellished and kind of portrays certain events in kind of like a pro Bruce kind of fashion for his uh, successors. And that was kind of part of my struggles. How do you kind of pick away at some of those layers and try and dig at something that's a little bit more of a neutral truth? Because I kind of really wanted to portray Bruce fairly in terms of defending him as a good person, and then also kind of really also highlighting the bad to kind of really force that sort of lack of black and white, and he's more of a great person. So I guess the way I tried to approach it was I kind of used these primary sources, the poems, or other little scraps of um, primary documents, like the Declaration of Aberroth and whatnot, um, to kind of build like the main core, and then kind of try to use scholarly sources to kind of help me kind of sift through that because I'm in no way, shape, or form an expert on Robert the Bruce. Yeah, we have a follow-up question for you about sources. Um, do you, from Amanda, do you think your approach or methodology could be applied to many different controversial historical figures or was it pretty specific for Robert the Bruce? Oh, sorry, was that from me or from Mariah? Uh, that was for you, Adam. Oh, sorry, sorry. Could you repeat that then? <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, this is from Amanda. Uh, do you think your approach or methodology could be applied to many different controversial historical figures, or was mm. it pretty specific to Robert the Bruce? I think it, I think it's an absolutely perfect um, way to kind of apply it to really complicated figures because I think I think all figures are in some way kind of complicated because no one is simply good or bad. I mean, obviously there's degrees for different people, but I think trying to do it as a trial and really kind of trying to dig at the, both the good and the bad side of a person is a good way to kind of highlight. I mean, you really think about, you know, how, how are we kind of thinking back on these people? How is public perception being uh, shaped by the way these figures are done? Like Robert the Bruce, he's a, a national hero for Scotland because of that independence um, that he was able to earn for them and kind of think about well, how, how can we both balance that good and bad? And I mean, you can apply it to any figures, Canadian or like Sir Johnny MacDonald. He's quite a controversial figure, especially in recent times. Like I think doing a history on trial for him, maybe in a different essay for someone else, I think that'd be a good approach. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for the questions from the audience. We appreciate it. We're now going to head over to Professor Rose to wrap it up and give some concluding thoughts. 
Um, thank you so much to the Emmas. I do not want to take up uh, very much time because this is absolutely not my show. Uh, this is very much the show and the showcase of the work that the students of Brock University have done um, in this uh, extraordinary year. And I mean extraordinary in all sorts of senses. It has been uh, challenging in many ways. It has presented um, unknown opportunities or unforeseen opportunities in very strange ways. I think what is remarkable uh, about this year in particular is how resilient our students have shown themselves and the um, reserves and resources that they have produced to uh, get through this year with, um, I've been throwing around all sorts of sort of hyperbolic descriptors like verve and aplomb and uh, gumption and moxie. Um, and I really am uh, extraordinarily proud of um, all of these students who have produced first class uh, undergraduate scholarship this year um, and, and who have uh, even more so shared that scholarship with a broader audience uh, displaying a confidence and a maturity um, that, that is more than we could expect of them. So I just want to uh, thank all of our journal authors for their um, really astute comments this evening and their, their, uh, their, their obviously clearly thought out um, research and, and overviews of their papers. And then I would like to thank uh, Dr. Elizabeth Vlasak for writing the foreword uh, to this year's uh, edition of the general. And then uh, more than more than anything, I would like to thank uh, Emma Faka and Emma Kerwin or as I just call them, the Emmas, um, for the hard work that has gone into this. We've been meeting every week uh, since early December, um, going over everything that needs to be done for the, the production of a scholarly journal. Um, all of those meetings have been remote. Um, they've seen me in my sweatpants more than I would have uh, admitted, um, but it has been uh, a really great experience and I'm really happy to have uh, been involved in this year's edition of the journal. I'm sorry, I think you can see one of my small children using the bathroom behind me. Um, this is life in COVID, uh, the work of a historian in COVID as this journal edition is all about. Um, so thank you all so very much for uh, attending this live stream launch party. Um, the issue itself will be published uh, momentarily. Um, and I think Adrian is going to share a link with the world uh, so that you can all view the, the wonderful scholarship of these uh, really bright and really hardworking and really resourceful students. So thank you all very much. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Uh, I will applaud on behalf of the audience. Yay. <laughs> Um, they're all applauding at home, I can guarantee. Uh, there's some really, really great comments and questions. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you. What interesting topics. Good for you. I am not, uh, I'm a local historian, so I would have, you know, covered the width of the railroad track running down St. Paul Street or something like that. So good for you for bringing piracy and poetry and um, uh, movies and our side chat in the group chat about Hamilton the musical. Um, Cal, I think you need to watch more TV. I'm just, I'm just gonna throw that out there. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you. Um, I'm just gonna wrap it up with a couple of, oops, wrap it up with a couple of uh, announcements here before we go. If I can figure out what I'm doing, there's so much tech on my screen right now. There we go. Sorry, everybody. Um, so again, thank you so much to our presenters tonight. Um, as uh, uh, Professor Rose mentioned, I shared the link to, um, to this issue of the general because I'm sure everyone would like to uh, actually read your papers. So uh, when it's when it's up and published, everyone can find it at that link. Um, and if anyone is having trouble finding it, I'll also post it in the comments to this video after uh, it's published on YouTube. Um, and if anyone is having trouble finding it, just send me an email and we'll connect you with 
uh, the issue. I'm super excited to read it as well. Uh, so uh, thank you very much again, everyone, for attending tonight's lecture. Uh, of course, uh, thank you again for all of your support for the entire museum lecture series. If you enjoy, enjoyed um, tonight's uh, lecture, again, please consider making a donation to the museum so we can continue to deliver the high quality programming you expect from us. Again, to make a donation, please call uh, the museum during our operating hours at 905-984-8880 or send us an email and we'll get in touch with you. Um, with our wonderful guests, including tonight and some other wonderful guests from Brock University, uh, as well as the community, we have now delivered over over 20 lectures. Can you believe it? Uh, mostly local history, but tonight we've expanded throughout time and space. Uh, so uh, check out the playlist uh, from our previous lectures on our YouTube channel. And why not share the playlist with your friends and family? We'd also like to remind everyone to please give us a like, follow, uh, subscribe, social media channels, smash all the things that YouTube uh, YouTubers say. I'm clearly not a YouTuber, but give us a follow. We are uh, all over the interweb, and so do check us out and uh, share us around the community to, you know, share in uh, our historical adventures and share our historical joy. So once again, I want to thank all, each and every one of you for participating tonight. I so much appreciate all of your hard work. Um, I can definitely identify with some of the research challenges that everyone's been um, uh, experiencing. Uh, luckily, though, the archives is just behind me, so I'm just going to drop that and make you all jealous. Uh, but definitely, it's been a, such a challenge not to be able to get to the archives. So kudos to each and every one of you. Again, one of probably, I don't know, maybe the hardest year of of an undergraduate's life ever. I don't know. Um, we'll leave it at that. And thank you so much to our audience again. We'll see everyone again on April 27th for Dr. Kim, Dr. Tim's Cook, Dr. Tim Cook's uh, lecture about remembering the Second World War and his new book, The Fight for History. Until then, have a good night, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you, everybody. I just have to stay on until the feed stops. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to ask if we're done the live stream. And there we go. They're all gone. They're all gone. There we go. They all okay.